Lab Code agents, welcome once again. Today we have a special guest, Bob Berg. I feel like I just talked to you maybe like two weeks ago, Bob. Thanks for being on again. <laughs> My absolute pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, man. But this time uh, we're going to be talking specifically about the Go Giver. I know you just had an event called at uh, Endless Referrals. That's what you call it, and it was in Orlando. How did that go? Uh, it went very well. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Nice. And for those of you who missed it, he's going to have another one, end of April. I just looked it up, April 27th through the 28th in Orlando. We'll put up a link as well. Yeah, 27th and 28th. Yep, yeah, exactly. That should, be, that should be super fun, Bob. So I'm glad you're doing this with us, man, because last time I only got about 13 to 15 minutes with you. It was super fast, and you dropped a lot of knowledge. And after we talked, I talked to my team, and I said, hey, Hey guys, we really need to read the Go Giver as a team because I've read it separately. What I what I think it does is it it really changes the way you look at your business and really focuses on what I think is the priority of all businesses, right? And that's that's giving first and building a business through relationships. Yeah. So can you can you tell me the essence of the Go Giver so that people that aren't familiar with the book and with you understand what that is? Sure. And you know, first, I just want to tell you how much I enjoy speaking with you. Every time I speak with you, I always, first of all, I have a great time, but I love the value that you look to bring to, to everyone who follows your work and everyone who tunes in, you know, you, you have the very focus that we talk about when we speak of go givers. And so thank you for being a, a shining example of that. Thanks man. And, I appreciate you know, that. The, the, the basic, you know, I guess definition, or I, I like how you wrote, uh, said it, the essence or the, um, uh, I'm trying to remember how you worded it, the, the basic premise, I guess, of, of the go-giver itself is simply that shifting one's focus, and this is, is really the key, shifting one's focus from getting to giving. Now, when we say giving in this context, we simply mean constantly and consistently providing immense value to others, understanding that doing so is not only a, a, a more pleasant way of conducting business, it's also the most financially profitable way as well. And not for some, you know, woo-woo way out reason, no, just do good things and karma will, no. Uh, it's, it's very, actually, when you think about it, it's very reasonable, it's very rational and very logical. Because when you're that person, unlike most others, unfortunately, it's just sort of how it is. When you're that person who can take your focus off of yourself and focus on making other people's lives better, solving their problems, finding ways to bring immense value to them, people feel good about you. People want to get to know you. They like you. They trust you. They want to be in relationship with you. They want to do business with you if that's appropriate, if they need what you offer. And introduce you and refer you to others. And so it really just makes good business sense to say, you know, not how, how can I serve myself, but how can I serve others? Uh, you know, when I speak at a sales conference, one of the first things I'll, I'll often say is that nobody's going to buy from you because you have a quota to meet, right? They're not going to buy from you because you need the money. And they're not even going to buy from you because you're a really nice person who believes in what you do. <laughs> they're going to buy from you ultimately because they believe they'll be better off by doing so than by not doing so. And in the free market-based economy in which most of us operate, and when I say free market, I simply mean no one is forced to buy from you or from anyone else. They do so of their own volition. So in a free market-based economy, that's the only reason why anyone should buy from you or from me or from anyone else, because they believe it's going to be worthwhile for them to do so. This is great, though, because that means if you can be that person who shifts your focus, okay, and does so intelligently and does so genuinely and does so authentically, and you're going to be the person who builds that relationship and who, who ends up having the sale. And it's going to be at, at higher prices, better margins. It's going to be with less stress. It's going to be more fun. And you're going to have people referring you to others because they feel so good about you. And they want to make sure those in their lives who they care about are taken, are taken care of. 
It's very true. So with all of that, because it's all, it all sounds extremely beneficial to, to us as salespeople. Why do you think that people gravitate to other things or other ways of doing business when, when this is more natural, right? Why is that? Well, there are a couple of things and you bring up a great point. First, is it natural? Well, I don't know. Um, you know, as human beings, you know, we are self-interested. Uh, it's how we were built. It's how we were created. And by the way, good thing, because in the cave person days, that self-interest kept us alive. You know, we had to, right? I mean, it was a matter of That's our, true. our ancestors alive. They had to be able to self. Now, the smart ones knew how to team up with others and collaborate, which it's it, so forth. But basically, it was staying alive. You And, and so... Over the year, while we don't have that same life and death death struggle today, it's certainly been hardwired into our, our, our DNA. So yeah, of course, we are self-interested. And then add that to the point, the fact that how are we taught to sell by so many people? Oh, you gotta be ruthless and you gotta ask for the clothes all the time and you gotta do this and you gotta try, you know. And it's you against that salesperson and if one of you wins and the other lose, and that's that's malarkey, by the way. It just it isn't it isn't so. Not if you're doing it correctly and doing it profitably. So so here here's the thing, and I think this is important because somebody might say, well, Bob, yeah, that's great, but you're right. I am self interested. You know, how do I authentically or genuinely focus on that other person since that is the best way to actually help myself by focusing on helping others? Well. Mm -hmm. Here's the, the good news, okay? We're not asking you to deny your self-interest, okay? We're not asking you to, to, to uh, subsume it or we're not asking you to ignore it. Uh, you know, we believe in dealing in truths and successful people deal in, in truths. They look at, at, at things and they look at human nature the way things are. Now, that doesn't mean they don't try to improve the situation, but what they do is they, they deal in truths they understand and embrace and respect the truths in order to then work within those truths and advance things forward for, for others and for ourselves. So no, we're not asking you to deny your self-interest. We're asking you to temporarily suspend your self-interest, okay? N regardless of, of what your own needs are, put those to the side because your prospect doesn't care about them, okay? Uh, nor should they when you think about it, when it comes to the buying process. Yeah. Uh, so when you focus on this other person, this person knows, hey, you know, we've all seen those people, these salespeople, uh, when I was younger, we used to call it commission breath, where <laughs> you know that they cared about one thing and that was getting your money into their pocket, okay? And so uh, the people who operate that way and you might think, well, I can fool these other, well, some people can, but it's pretty hard to do and it's, it's not very sustainable to do business that way. Uh, not only that, it's not the right way to do business, but, but that aside, um, when you're focused on yourself and focused on the money, what happens is you talk too much, right? Because now you're just kind of blasting that person with all the benefits about your, before you even know that those are, are going to apply to them. All right. So instead of asking questions and listening and understanding what that person needs, wants, and desires, you're, you're concerned with what you want, need, and desire. And you kind of, you talk faster, you talk more, you don't listen. When they have an objection, well, you get a little bit almost defensive about it because, hey, that objection is standing in the way of my money. Right. And you start connecting benefits and closing before they're ready. Now, and I would say to somebody, hey, is someone more likely or less likely to buy from you then? And, you know, the, most people will say, well, less likely. Now, let's say, though, that you're the same person and, you know, maybe you're just starting out and you, you know, financially, you're not where you want to be and you kind of really need the money, but you're smart enough to understand that you are needing the money is not why this person's going to buy from you. <laughs> That's true. So suspend your self-interest. Just put it aside temporarily, okay? And then when you go in, focus totally on how you can be of value to them. You're going to ask questions. You understand that selling is defined as simply discovering what the other person wants, needs, or desires, and helping them to get it. And then you ask the questions, you listen, not to sharp angle them into a close, but you listen to just understand what it is they're looking to accomplish. And only when you know 
do you then tie in the benefits of your product or service with what they need, want, or desire? When they give you an objection, you welcome the objection. You understand that probably the objection they're giving you isn't really the, the core objection. It's more a manifestation of the actual objection because most people don't exactly know what it is they're having a problem with, so they will say the usual things that you know that you hear but what you're going to do is you're going to work with that person and uh, together as partners and explore and 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 check your premises and bring it back so that both you and that person understands the core objection then you're able to to handle it and work through it together and then when it's time for you to close all you there's nothing fancy there's nothing slick you're simply now asking them to take action on something they've already told you they want to do but they know more than anything else that your concern is for them. And when that's the case, are they gonna buy from you, you know, more likely and in that case or not? And then the chances are sure, much, much more. Then you can always take your, your self-interest back. But here's the thing, you'll start to find that there's no natural dichotomy between interest in others and interest in yourself. Because to the, degree, to the degree that you help others, I remember what Zig Ziglar said, and some of your, your, your listeners now or viewers may not even remember Zig. I find a lot of my younger audiences now don't remember Zig, but Zig was the best, right? He was wonderful. And Zig used to say his most famous saying, it's often misquoted, which always bothers me, but, but his actual saying was, you can have everything in life you want if you'll just help enough other people get what they want but the focus needs to be on helping them get what they want. This is why John David Mann, my co-author of the Go-Giver series, why we say that money is simply an echo of value. Okay, money is an echo of value. It's the uh, thunder, if you will, to values lightning, which means nothing more than that the value must come first. The focus must be on providing value to that person. The money you receive is simply a very natural result of the value you've provided. And that's what happens when you focus on that other person. So when you do this, and you're now starting to make a lot of money and you're feeling great about yourself and the, the, you're, you're bringing such value to others, you'll start to see, wow, I love focusing on, on others. It's not about focusing on myself, it's about focusing on others and realizing the reward. So how did you and John David Mann come up with the idea of the go-giver? Because it sounds like it's um, first, obviously, it's definitely a mindset shift, right? Because like you said, we naturally gravitate to wanting just to, to do things that benefit us, right? And so how did, were you always like, did you and did John David Mann grow up and were like always giving or was, uh, it, a, was it a transition? What brought this about? Well, John and I both actually had great parents who set fantastic examples of, of living in this way. Uh, so both very fortunate in that way. Um, you know, my, I think, breakthrough in this regard came about 40 years ago. I had I'd been in sales for a couple of years after a, a brief and very uneventful career in broadcasting. <laughs> I had graduated into sales. I knew nothing about sales, but so I floundered for a while until I, um, you know, came across some great books in the bookstore on selling, and I, I studied, and I, I got pretty good at it. And so a couple of years after I started, I was, I was working with a company selling a, a high-end uh, product. And, you know, again, I was doing well, but not nearly where I should have been. And I remember coming back to the, the office one day uh, at the company where I was working and the, a, a guy, a much older guy there, and he was just about to retire. Uh, and I didn't know him very well and he wasn't even in the sales department, but he was one of these guys, he didn't say much, but whenever he did say something, it was always really profound. And I think he saw me as kind of as Joe in The Go-Giver, the protagonist, the, the main protege who yeah. you know, had a lot of potential work really hard, was sort of successful, but not anywhere near reaching his, his potential. And of course, with Joe, his, his focus was on himself, right? Not on, not on others. And, and, and I think that's where I was. And this, this older man, I, he saw that. And he, he said to me, Berg, can I give you some advice? And I said, yeah, please do. 
And he said, if you want to make a lot of money in sales, he said, don't have making money as your target. Your target is serving others. Now, when you hit the target, he said, you'll get a reward and that reward will come in the form of money. And you can do with that money whatever you choose. But never forget, he said, the money is simply the reward for hitting the target. It ain't the target itself. Your target is serving others. And that's where I really came to see for the first time that great salesmanship was not about the salesperson, right? That great salesmanship was not even about the product or the service, as important as that is. Great salesmanship is about the other person. It's about that prospective customer or client, that person whose lives you're hoping to touch with the exceptional value you provide. And when we can, when we can have that in mind, we're, you know, we're really nine steps ahead of the game in a 10 step game. And in that, you know, quick talk by that, that person, I call him a, my, one of my great friends, leadership authority, Dondi Scumachi, she and I kind of made up the term together. Although I think she probably made it up and I just agreed with her because she said, <laughs> but we call these people drive by mentors. And these happen to be people who just kind of come out of nowhere or, you know, someone you don't know really, really well. And they happen to say something really profound at the exact time you need to hear it and you're ready to hear it. Kind of like what you're doing now to part of our audience. Oh, well, thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. Thank Makes you. Sense. But uh, that, that's really how we, you know, kind of came up with that. And, and, uh, you know, then, then put the, the, the book together. And John, of course, is a fantastic storyteller, right? I'm a how-to guy. I'm step one, step two, step three. John is a, <laughs> a fantastic storyteller. And nice. so we collaborated on that and it, it, you know, worked out well. That's a, that's a very good partnership, man. So let's get right into the five laws. So for those of, of you that are barely listening in and don't know the book, there are five laws and let's go over law number one, and we'll just go over them pretty quickly, just so that people can understand what they are. The law of value, what, what is that? Yeah, so this one says that your true worth, in the business sense, of course, your true worth is determined by how much more you give in value than you take in payment. Now, when you first hear that, it sounds kind of counterintuitive, right? Give more in value than I take in payment. That sounds all nicey-nice and everything, but you know, isn't that going to drive me to bankruptcy? right? Give more in value than I take in payment. So we simply have to understand the difference between price and value. And it's significant, right? Uh, price is a dollar amount. It's a dollar figure. It's finite. It is what it is. Value, on the other hand, is the relative worth or desirability of a thing, of something to the end user or beholder. So in other words, what is it about this thing, this product, service, concept, idea, what have you, that brings so much more worth, so it brings so much worth or value to someone that they will willingly, again, free market, or willing exchange, they'll willingly exchange their money for it and be ecstatic that they did while you make a very healthy profit. I often give the example on a very, very basic level of uh, that you uh, uh, hire an accountant to do your taxes. She charges you a thousand dollars. That's her fee or her price. But what's the value she provides? Well, she saves you $5,000 in taxes, saves you countless hours of time, um, provides you and your family with the security and the peace of mind of knowing it was done correctly. She gave you well over $5,000 in value in exchange for a $1,000 price. She gave you more in value than she took in payment. You feel fantastic about it. And she made a very healthy profit because to her, it was well worth it to lease out or, or sell her time and expertise for that thousand dollars. So in fact, one of my old you know, heroes, Harry Brown used to say in a free market-based exchange, there are always at least two profits, the buyer profits and the seller profits because both of people come away better off after the exchange than they were before the exchange. So that's, that's the key. Uh, in the story, in The Go-Giver, it was the restaurant, uh, Ernesto's Italian, yet Frate's Italian Cafe. So, you know, it was a high-end restaurant. You paid a lot for a meal, but you came away between the, the food itself, the presentation, the atmosphere, the ambiance, the way you were greeted and taken care of and everything. You may have paid $100, $150, but you came away feeling like a million bucks. You receive more in value than you took in payment, while, of course, Ernesto Iafrate made a very healthy profit. 
went yeah. into cost of goods sold as compared to his, right? So, um, so that's really the law of value. Now, it's deeper than that, of course, because technology is leveled off the playing field. So many products and services are the same. So what keeps, you know, if, if you can, you, most products are pretty much the same, but even if yours are better, <laughs> okay, or your service is better, until yeah. your prospective customer realizes that, they don't realize it. So if, if, the, if the prospect cannot distinguish between any two or more salespeople, well, it's always going to come down to who has the lowest price. Do you, um, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry. Do you ever feel that with the law of value, it's, it's very psychological and that's why the approach works so well, which is look, this person is like you said at the beginning, which was, um, they feel like they're going to be better off working with you. Right. Sure. So how much of that is actually perceived value versus real, real value? Well, it should be both. It should be both. Uh, you know, otherwise it would be fraud if, if you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. But I'm saying a lot of people overthink the process and say, well, you know, I don't have enough to give. So they don't give, oh. they don't give themselves enough credit. So, so yeah, no. So let's look. And that's a great point. So let's look because, because again, you know, if, if, if there's no significant difference, then well, it is going to come down to the lowest price. But unless your last name is Walmart or Amazon.com trying to be the low price supplier is not a good idea right it's not it's not sustainable it's not it's not fun it's not profitable um no we want you selling at the higher end of the of the price uh range because we want you selling on high value not low price when you sell on price you're a commodity when you sell on value you're a resource so the question is if most products and services are pretty much the same how do you increase that value and, and uh, the short answer is you become that additional value because they're buying from you before they buy from your, your company and they're buying your company before they buy the product or service. So the question then becomes, okay, well, how do I communicate that additional value? That, that, right? And that's, that's beautifully said, dude. I have to interrupt you there because that's so powerful and I think people may have missed that. Uh, and, and that comes across really really well uh, have you read or have you looked at uh, the infinite game by simon sinek it just came out late last year i have not read that one i've read two of his other books i have not read that one okay well it goes along the same lines you have that same mindset which is the infinite mindset which is look i'm in this for the long run right and i want i want to compete against other people in a healthy environment where i'm looking to differentiate myself with the value that i give right and what you said right there, which all real estate agents should be paying attention is you're selling on value. You become a resource. That's how we stop from getting extinct as salespeople. Oh, sure. That's the key right there. So dude, that was, that was, I wrote that down and highlighted it and circled it. That was beautiful. Thank you, Thank you for that. So that easily goes into the law of compensation. Well, what is that? Can I start, can I continue just with one, one more moment? Yeah. Because, because we, we ask, well, how do we communicate that additional value? And there are dozens, if not hundreds of ways to do that, okay? But they tend to come down to five, what we call elements of value. And those elements of value are excellence, consistency, attention, empathy, and appreciation. And uh, to the degree that you can communicate one or more hopefully all five of these elements of value at every touch point from the first moment you meet that person whether it's an inbound connection or an outbound or whether you've met this person at, a, at an event somewhere locally or however it is from that moment through the relationship building process the follow-up and follow through the sales process the referral gathering process to the degree that you can communicate those five elements of value that's the degree that you take price and your competition right out of the picture. Now, all five of those we can talk about for 20 minutes, but, um, but when we can do that, now we're, we're uh, you know, now we're rolling. Now, now we're, we're communicating that value and it's not costing us additional money. And it's, uh, you know, and it's, and it's something that is, as Scott McCain 
uh, likes to say, it, it distinguishes you. With the five uh, elements of value, they sounded like, uh, and, and I don't remember them offhand, but they sounded like it all started with really self-awareness. Well, it is. You do have to have that excellence, consistency, attention, empathy, and appreciation. And while all of those are about the other person, it, it begins with you understanding yourself and understanding your strengths and being able to communicate those strengths as they apply to that other person. How would you say someone in sales or just people in general can go about becoming um, or having these these five things in them? Because it's, it's obviously it's going to take practice, but um, how do you elevate to that? Well, I mean, you, you, you study though, you make a study of them. I mean, let's, let's take, for example, just one of them, let's take empathy. And it's a word yeah. we hear about a lot these days because emotional intelligence has really kind of hit the, uh, the mainstream. And, and we know yep. that empathy is a huge part of emotional intelligence. So you look at empathy and we know the de dictionary definition of empathy is the identification with or vicarious experiencing of another person's feelings. Now that sounds like a fancy way of saying, put yourself in the other person's shoes. And it would be until you realize that we all, you know, most of us have different sized feet. So we literally can't put ourselves in the other person's <laughs> shoes. Figuratively, we can't put ourselves in another person's head or their heart. We don't necessarily know what they're feeling. We may not be able to relate to what they're feeling. The good news is that, that empathy doesn't necessarily mean you do know what they're feeling. If you do and you've had the same experience, well, great, communicate that. It will be very appreciated. But really what empathy is, is, is not that you understand exactly how they feel. It's communicating that to them that you, un and by the way, this communication might be in what you say, how you say it, or simply how you show up. But it's communicating that you understand their you, that they're feeling something and that this something is distressful to them and that you're there to help them through it. Uh, let me give you a quick example. And I know you, you know, you're, so many of your, your viewers are in real estate and you probably have a, a bunch of people who are mortgage lenders, I would think, that, that probably follow you as, as well. Or a lot of your, you know, real estate people certainly work with mortgage lenders. Yep. Well, a mortgage lender, when you think about it, day after day, they're, they're working with people in terms of, of providing these really big loans. But in order to do this, they have to ask a lot of questions that may be uncomfortable for people. So this person in front of you who's looking for this, this loan for their, their, their new home, they seem to be kind of a little defensive or not forthcoming or a little bit. Now, if you don't have empathy, you're thinking, oh, what's wrong with this person? What, what's going on? You know, uh, why won't they be more cooperative? If you have empathy, you say, okay, there's something, and I may not know what it is, but there's something this person's feeling that is kind of stopping them from being open and helping me to help them. And so here's what you might realize that while you're used to asking people a very intimate question every day about their finances, th and you do it every day, this person might be going, this might be the first time or second time that this person's ever had to, to ask for such a big loan. Uh, they, they're not comfortable with money. They may not know the questions that they should even ask, but they're kind of, they don't want to look ignorant and, and they don't want to, uh, they may have been brought up in a household where they were told you don't discuss money with strangers, yeah. right? Or they may be embarrassed about their financial situation. So this, as a mortgage lender, if you're empathetic, again, it doesn't mean you relate to them or you understand how they feel, you don't necessarily. But it means that you can now ask them questions in a way that makes them feel safer and makes them feel comfortable. Using an I message, it might be, you know, it might just be me, but I, I get the feeling that there might be some issues that you feel a little uncomfortable with. And I just want to let you know that, you know, I do this all the time. So for me, you know, it's not a, a real personal thing in terms of someone's finances, but I realize it could be for you. So if you have any questions or any concerns, I just want you to feel comfortable asking me, knowing that my job here is simply to help you.
to okay, them. Okay, now you've helped so. this person feel safe. They feel comfortable. They feel like they're understood. And basic human nature, we want to feel understood. Yeah, that's, dude, that's, that's right on. One thing that I was also thinking as you were talking is what you mentioned at the very beginning, you mentioned at the beginning that you said you, you and uh, John David, man, had parents that, that really were a good example to you guys in the way that they gave value. They, they were progressive in their way of thinking, I'm assuming uh, very emotionally intelligent or, or somewhat. Yeah. And for those that are listening in, you know, it's up to you to, to really be that example to those people around you, you know, whether it's your kids, your siblings, your, your spouses, right? And, and those that are watching. But I think we always forget that we make such a big impact on those people that are watching that, that it was just important to, to uh, remind everybody because you mentioned it and it had had such an amazing impact on your life. Uh, well, thank you. I yeah, so, uh, dude, let's go to the next one. Law of compensation. Yeah. Well, this one says your income is determined by how many people you serve and how well you serve them. So where law number one says to give more in value than you take in payment, law number two tells us that the more people whose lives we touch with the exceptional value we provide, the more money with which we'll be rewarded. Your accountant in the first example did a great job of giving more in value than she took in payment. So if you're her client, you feel great about her, you would do business with her again, and you would probably tell others about her as well. Well, her other clients feel the same way. So our accountant is very quickly amassing what we call an army of personal blocking ambassadors. And as she continues to add that kind of exceptional value to the lives of more and more people, her income will continue to grow and grow. Uh, in the story, Nicole Martin, one of the mentors, told Joe, the protege, that law number one, the law of value, as important as it is, that represents your potential income. But the law of um, compensation is about how many lives you impact. That's what equals your actual compensation. That's, that's beautifully said. And, you know, with what we have now, with the capability of, of social media to be able to reach thousands at one time, that this law can just be exponential in the returns that we get as long as we put law number one in first, which is the law of value. Yeah, that's the foundational principle. You're exactly right. This is also why referrals um, are so important because referrals really cut down the, the time. Uh, when you think about it, referred prospects are easier to set the appointment with uh, through borrowed influence. With referred prospects, price is less of an issue because, again, you've been sort of pre-sold, right? That, But also... With, with a referred prospect, it's simply easier to complete the transaction or the sale. Why? Because of bo borrowed trust or what we call vicarious experience. No, this person hasn't done business with you yet, but, yet, but someone who they know, like, and trust has said, this is the person to go with. This is the only person you need to speak with. This is the person who's going to take care of you. This is the person who's going to put your interest first. And that's pretty powerful. Then, you know, the, then one other benefit of a referred prospect is since that's how they met you, to them, referring you to others is a natural part of the process. And, you know, one of the things we go through in that workshop is how to use the exact language, exactly how to say it, so that you don't get the response that you, we've all heard before, right? I can't think of anybody right now. But when I do, I'll call you or let you know. And of course, that, could it ever happen? Sure, sometimes, but no, you don't want to build a career on that. So we want to, we, what we want to do is create the environment for that person to be successful in thinking of good, high quality people to refer. Well, one of the things that we do along those lines is we try to narrow down the the thoughts that they're thinking. So what we do is we ask, Hey, Hey Bob, uh, you know, thanks for, thanks for your time. And do you have any family members that are looking to make a move in the next six months or 
maybe they've mentioned it. So instead of saying anyone, because the brain could go anywhere, we're right. very specific. That's, that's, that's exactly why it happens. Because when you say, you know anyone who, or who do you know? Well, most people know about 250, 300 people. So <laughs> what happens is a collage of people, nameless, faceless people dance through their head. They can't think of anybody. So no, you've got to be able to very gently and effectively nicely funnel down their world into small groups of people who they can easily see and just give them a few people to see in each frame and they'll they'll be much more likely to come up with names and because you've taken the stress off their memory because it's when we're trying hard to think as we can't think of it we panic right no when you create the environment for their success more names come to mind because again uh, the memory is working for them not against them Makes total sense, man. Well, let, let's get into the law of influence, which is number three. Yeah, well, this one says your influence is determined by um, how abundantly you place other people's interests first. Again, sounds counterintuitive, counterproductive, maybe even Pollyanna-ish, right, when you first hear it. But then you think about it. The greatest leaders you know, the top influencers, the highest producing, highest money earning salespeople, this is how they run their lives and conduct their businesses. They're always looking for ways to make others successful, to bring value to others. They, um, But, you know, let me um, qualify that, too, because uh, it, this can be very easily misinterpreted, and I think it's very important. When we say place the other person's interests first, we, we don't mean you should be anyone's doormat or you should be a martyr or you should be self-sacrificial in any way. Absolutely not at all. It's simply as Joe, the protege in the story, learned from several of the mentors, the uh, golden rule of business of sales is that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. And there's no faster, more powerful, or more effective way to elicit those feelings toward you from others than by genuinely and authentically moving from that I focus or me focus to that other focus. Making, as, as Sam, one of the mentors in the story, told Joe, making your win all about the other person's win. And as you develop a reputation for doing that, wow, you become that go-to person, that center of influence, that person people come to, they ask for advice, they want your help, they, right? And you just get, you know, you have people out there referring you left and right. That, that brought up so many things in my head, man. One of those was something that you're connected to, and that was, uh, I think it's called the faces of, right? Okay, good. I just wanted to get that uh, right. Connected, yeah. They, um, um, they. I mean, they're not our company. They're. It's not a uh, part of our company. That's a separate uh, company that I heard about. Yeah, uh, that's how we reconnected through them. Uh, right. So. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. And I mean, they totally did a wonderful, fantastic job with. Them. In fact, I refer them at my public seminars when I have people who I know have local businesses. I actually refer them and I've handed out a bunch of their books because I think what they did was just such a perfect use of the go-giver principles, finding ways to be absolutely, totally focused. And the people who follow their system just have done wonderfully well with it. Yeah, because it uses your principles, man. They're giving back. They're giving back. I don't know that they're giving back. I think they're just giving they're just giving. You know, I mean it's not I think giving back is is when we think of, you know, the term giving back. Uh, you know, you took something from someone first and now oh. you're coming back. You know what I'm saying? I, I never use that term, okay? Here's, here's the thing. I, I, I love the idea of what people mean, okay? But what they mean is you're giving charity. You're helping others. You're doing something for others, that, you know, and which is a beautiful thing. We, we endorse that totally. But I think the term, and I, I think this is important, the term giving back, which has come really into the mainstream, the basic premise of it, is that you've made a lot of money, okay? You've been lucky or whatever. Well, now it's, it, you need to give back some of that. And I'm gonna question that because I'm gonna say that, again, if you're operating in a free market, you didn't have special rules, laws, and regulations in your favor that you've bought from someone else. In other words, that you did this through honesty and integrity and simply bringing value to the marketplace and people willingly and gladly paid you money for your products and services, and you made a lot of money, 
you don't have to give back because you didn't take anything from anyone. You, you, you should give, of course, who wouldn't? Give to charity, mentor, help the community, do everything you can. But I don't see that as giving back. I see that as simply giving sure. because it's congruent with your values to do so. And I think we're living in, you know, we talk about this really with the law of receptivity about how, how the, the, the world around us gives us horrible messages about uh, prosperity and money. You know, if you, if you listen to the news or you, you're on the internet or you hear from so many of the politicians, you think if you've made a lot of money, you did it on the backs of others or by doing, you know, uh, we hear, you know, the, the um, headlines that sell are about what? They're about uh, Enron, right? Or, or Tyco or Bernie Madoff or, or, uh, or Volkswagen falsifying their emissions. Uh, tests or uh, what was the bank uh, that that was um, where the the leadership was was kind of making their people um, sell the uh, Wells Fargo Wells Fargo okay yeah. and here's the thing do those happen yeah ab absolutely by the way typically not as a result of a free market there's usually a lot of cronyism that's taking place there but let's put that aside there are always going to be people who do bad things because people are human but no for for the majority of people, okay, who, who make a lot of money, it's because they have found a way to add value to the marketplace, solve people's problems, and, and they have done it the right way. Um, and that should be respected. It shouldn't be looked at as, as you know, you're evil because you have money. And these people are creating jobs for others and they're creating... So, um, so, so no, I, I, you know, respectfully reject the premise that when you have a lot, that when you make money honestly and you're charitable, that you're giving back. I just say you're giving. Yeah, I agree with you, man. Well, let me be very specific then with what they're doing. I feel like they're hitting on three of your laws the most. That's the law of value, the law of influence, and the law of authenticity, which is the next one that we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you and, think? And they're still, well, they're still serving a lot of people. So there okay. is compensation and they're, and the people who are doing this are receiving. So all five laws are, are actually, and by the way, I wasn't calling you out when you said about giving back. I was just saying, it's just my personal. No, thing. I like that. Dude. I'm right. It just, it's just how I see it. Now that's going to become a story, Bob. Like at the time Bob Berg told me, no, 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 it's not like that. And I'm like, you know what? You're right. I well, love I mean, I've had this conversation with a, with a lot of people because again, they hear, you know, the go giver and they think, well, giving back. And, and again, I just, you know, I'm, I'm not really one that just kind of, I'm always polite and respectful, hopefully, but I, I tend to not let things go that I really don't, you know, agree with. And, and sometimes I think that the, and again, it's very easy to do because the, the, um, what's the right word? It's just the word, the, the term itself has has just become so ubiquitous that you know we um but i think words are important and it kind of you know but i, I think what these guys are doing with the uh, faces of it's just they're finding a way to give value first they are just immersing their marketplaces in value and people feel so good about it and so good about them that they want to do business with them and it's just it's a beautiful thing uh, the law of authenticity says that the most valuable gift you have to offer is yourself. And the realtor in the story, Deborah, she shared a very important lesson, and that is all the skills in the world, the sales skills, technical skills, people skills, as important as they are, and they, they are very important, they're also all for naught if you don't come at it from your true authentic core. Now, when you do, when you, as we like to say, show up as yourself, day after day, week after week, month after month. Well, again, people feel good about you. They feel comfortable with you. They feel safe with you. They know you, they like you, they love you, they trust you. They are much more likely to want to be in relationship with you and to uh, refer you, introduce you to others. So, you know, it's, it's really important to understand we need to show up as ourselves. And if we're not, it's, it's most likely because we don't have the self-confidence to do so. Because let's face it, it's difficult to show up authentically when a person doesn't think they have anything authentically worthwhile to, to bring to the table. Um, but everyone does. And so the, I, I think there are two types of value that people have. One is just intrinsic value, just by 
being a human being, we have value. But the other is market value. And I define market value as that combination of strengths, traits, talents, and characteristics that a person brings to the table that allows them to serve the marketplace in such a way that they'll be financially rewarded for it. And we all have these strengths, um, but it can be difficult to embrace them because again, it goes back to being human beings. We're so emotionally involved with ourselves. We're so emotional, emotionally close to ourselves. We don't necessarily see when we're doing something that's really that big a deal or that we have that because we just think, well, that's how the world is. Everybody can do that, right? We see. And so it's really important that whether through self-discovery or through you know connecting with a mentor or a coach or just somebody who you trust and who cares about you, but who's not so emotionally wrapped up in your life that they also can't see the forest for the trees, that you, that you counsel with them and help have, and make it so they can help you <laughs> to really see those great qualities, those strengths that you have. And sometimes, it's not just one strength, it's a combination of strengths. Uh, Scott Adams, the great cartoonist uh, for Dilbert, who, who wrote a great book uh, called, oh, gosh, I think he said, Failing, oh, so it was something like Failing My Way to Success or, or how, to, how to Fail Most of the Time and Still Succeed. As it, and I apologize, I'm just not, but it was one of his earlier books. It was a brilliant book. He talked about a talent stack. In other words, not being so great at any, not being the best at any one thing, but being very competent at a number of things that went together very well and could help serve others. So I think that's, you know, what we have to uh, look at when we're talking about being authentic, that we discover our strengths, we lead with those strengths, and we're able to, you know, serve more people that way. That's very true, man. That that book that you're talking about is um, uh, how to fail at almost everything and still win big. And still win big. Yes, yes, yes. Very good. Yes, yes. He, he brought that one up uh, on a podcast he did. I think it was with Tim Ferriss uh, a little bit ago, which was amazing uh, on, on talent stacking. Yeah. That oh, was that was brilliant. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That was a great book. So you said a few things there, and one thing that stood out for me was confidence because this law the, the the law of authenticity requires to have uh, confidence or to be able to believe in yourself enough to show up repeatedly as yourself yeah right? yeah and <laughs> and i think um one of the things that one of my friends you may know him or you may not his name is sharon srivatsa he's uh he's the ceo of kingston lane he he said something about confidence that really stood out i wrote it out so i'm reading it i didn't memorize this yeah. Okay. And, uh, and I want to know what you think. He said, cadence drives confidence. It's not about the intensity in which you do something. It's the commitment to doing it in a regular way because the repetitions drive results and the results drive the confidence. Mm, beautifully said. And I thought that was beautiful. It reminded me exactly of what you were saying, right? It's the consistency of showing up. And, you know, one other thing about authenticity, because I, I think the term is, you know, it's used so much, it kind of loses its meaning and can be interpreted different ways. But I really want to um, just suggest that people don't use authenticity as an excuse for not improving themselves. You know, it's like the person who says, well, uh, I have anger issues and I yell at people a lot and that's just the way I am. And if I were to act any differently, that wouldn't be authentic of me. And of course that's baloney. Uh, that's malarkey. What it means is that this person has an authentic problem uh, <laughs> that he needs to authentically work on in order to be a better, more effective, higher version of his authentic self. So we never want to, to use authenticity as an excuse for staying where we are. We utilize it as a way to grow into our highest self. That's a really great point, because I hear a lot of people say, well, you know what, I'm just that way. That's the way I am, or that's the way I'm built. And you know, that's a, and that's a good philosophy if you wanna be unsuccessful in business and not have really good relationships. Um, and I, you know, I'm not saying that people who are like that aren't ever successful in business. Sometimes they are, but boy, is it a lot tougher that way. 
and I would say they rarely have good relationships. <laughs> Dude, that's you're that right on, which leads us into the law of re receptivity. Receptivity, yeah, that's an important one. That's a, such an important one because while well, you know, if 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 the law of value is the foundational principle, the law of receptivity is sort of what brings it home. Uh, and this one says the key to effective giving is to stay open to receiving, which really means nothing more than we, yes, we breathe out, but we also have to breathe in or we cannot sustain life. We certainly can't thrive, right? Doing one or the other. We breathe out carbon dioxide, but we also breathe in oxygen. Try doing just one and not the other. <laughs> right? uh, we breathe out, which is given. And we breathe in, which is receiving. We spoke a little earlier about the negative messages we receive from the world around us about prosperity and money and all those things. And it's everywhere. And it's unconscious. Uh, and that's, you know, leads to a lot of self-sabotage because on, a, if an, on an unconscious level, you think having money is bad or means you got there in a bad way or that it means, means you hurt. Oh, well, you're not going to accept. You're not going to allow yourself to receive it. This is why I'm constantly reading and, uh, people like Randy Gage and his blog and, uh, David, um, uh, oh shoot. You know, I hate when I, when I don't remember a name because I want to be able to, uh, David Nagel, uh, in, in his blog, uh, N-E-A-G-L-E, -E, uh, and I mentioned Randy Gage in his blog, people like Bob Proctor, people like uh, Ellen Rogan, who's a financial advisor out of Chicago who wrote a great book. And, and what Ellen really teaches is about is how money is, you know, and in, in investing is a, an emotional game, a head game, and you've got to be willing to allow yourself to thrive you know, when, when doing so. So there's lots of great people teaching prosperity out there. And I think we need to study it actively. And the reason is, is because we get all this horrible garbage into our head all the time about wealth, prosperity, abundance, money, the, the negative messages, not mixed messages, negative messages. We need to start questioning those premises and how and why those people who are saying those things are saying them and where they learn them. But if we actively read Randy's blog or we listen to his or watch his prosperity TV uh, broadcast or we read his books or David Nagel's uh, books or Bob Proctor's or Ellen Rogan's or, uh, you know, the different, study that prosperity and, and, and get that into your head on an active basis and start living that. Uh, but, you know, so despite the messages we receive, giving and receiving are not opposite concepts. They're simply two sides of the very same coin, and they work together in tandem. It's not, are you a giver or a receiver? No, you're a giver and a receiver. But what you know is the way universal law works is that the giving is first. The focus is on giving value to others. When you do this constantly and you do this consistently and you do it from the head and do it from the heart and you do it, from, it's going to come back to you. And again, not for any magical, mystical reasons. No, you've created a benevolent context for your success and you've got to be willing to receive it. That's, that's beautiful, man. It's kind of like the go-giver and receiver. That's what it is, right? Because right, well, Sure. So, well, so many. Yeah, I think I, I'm one of those people that didn't learn to accept what was being given uh, for a very, very, very long time, well into my uh, late 30s. I'm I'm 42, and uh, it was a big challenge for me. And I have some ideas as to why. Um, obviously, part of it is environment. But what do you see as the biggest challenge for people not really allowing themselves to grow? and to be able to accept what's being given to them or receiving? Uh, it's it's a, just a huge challenge. It's, it's a, a tough way to live life when you don't allow yourself to receive. That's why I think it's so important to study it. Um, uh, you know, again, you can, all the giving in the world is great. All the giving of value to others is fantastic. But if you're not willing to allow yourself to receive, you're kind of blocking the flow. You're denying others the ability to give. Uh, and you know, it, it, it starts really when you think about it by first realizing that it's an issue. Because again, 
this hits us mostly on an unconscious level. Uh, you know, Randy Gage brought up about how any major motion picture typically features two types of people. And once you, once you, and he does this amazing vignette about the movie Titanic, which is probably one of the highest grossing movies of all time, which um, it had the most negative messages in it. Now I won't go through the vignette, but, it, but I'll give you one thing. But if you, if you ever get a chance to do a search on Randy Gage's Titanic story, uh, mm -hmm. it, it was just, it was just amazing. But, um, and then he updated it with, with Avatar, a, a movie by the same director, which outsold Titanic, which was basically the same basic message. But as Randy says, in any uh, chart-busting movie, there are always two char basic characters portrayed. There are the, the good people who are typically portrayed as struggling, as poor, as the underdog, right? But they're happy. They're always poor, but happy. And, but they're always being, being stepped on, stepped over, taken advantage of by who? The rich people who are always mean and nasty and cowardly and have no soul. Uh, this is the Titanic was a perfect example of this. And he gives all these great examples, but, uh, but one, one other wonderful example he gave was of the, the first movie Spider-Man. And you may remember that Peter Parker is sitting uh, in the living room with, with Uncle Ben, his Uncle Ben. Yeah. And Uncle Ben said to him, Peter, we may not be rich, but at least we're honest. Ugh, what a horrible line. What a horrible lesson for a young kid to hear. Because what it's saying is, if you're honest, you're probably poor. If you're rich, you're probably not honest. Now it's like, well, that's just one example. Yeah, it's one example of thousands if you go, if you watch movies or yeah. read books or read the paper, if people are still reading the paper or go through Twitter or what have you. And these get into people's again, unconscious, but we don't even know. Yes. That's what we're thinking. So it begins with, uh, with you know, if you feel you have trouble receiving, it's, it's coming to grips with that. It's dealing, again, dealing with truth, right? And mm -hmm. saying, okay, that's an issue. Why is it? Now let's do some exploring. Now a great book, by the way, this was written back in the 60s, it was called Psycho-Cybernetics by Dr. Maxwell Maltz. And he shows how, you know, basically our beliefs, our unconscious beliefs drive everything. And then he, does, he, and he goes through all these great examples and explanations in the first part of the book. And the second part, he kind of helps you retrain your brain. So uh, again, I, my suggestion is make a study of prosperity. Nice. I like that, dude. What I found with me was that it was, I was feeling like I was being selfish for some reason. And I had to fight that. That's one of what Randy would call the memes, the mind viruses. Oh, yeah. if you receive, you're selfish for doing yeah. so. Only selfish, but right? You know, so. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah, but I, I finally broke through. But your book, your book really helps people take them from the very beginning of understanding how to approach this this new way of thinking which is giving right into into making it into an actual way of life because this is what it is you you have to live it but for it to work at its highest highest level so i appreciate that man again you're having an event april 27th the 28th in orlando and it's called Endless Referrals. You can go to EndlessReferrals.com. Is that the yeah, one? Yeah, EndlessReferrals.com. Endless Referrals, the go giver way. And we allow just, you know, 20. Actually, I think we're doing 30 people this time. And because it's very interactive. So you're getting me. I mean, it's not just me talking for a couple of days. We're engaged. We're doing It's a whole group thing. We have usually very successful people there in the audience. So everybody's interacting. We, there's a lot. There's a lot there. It's, it's well worth the two days, you know, if you can make it there. I assume it's really high level with, with just about 30 people. That's very, that's very, very, very positive. And some really good relationships that you can probably make oh, in that yeah. room. Oh, absolutely. I love that, man. Well, thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. Anything you want to end with? I uh, just, you know, just for, for, for people to continue to go out there and just ask themselves the question, how can I be of value to the marketplace today? And as we know, the marketplace is made up of individuals. So how can I help someone? Oh, let me read this one thing to you. This is from, uh, from Michael Singer. Michael Singer wrote a couple of amazing books. Uh, one is The Untethered Soul, 
and one is the surrender experiment, okay? Listen to this quote from Michael, and I have this written down, so I'm, I'm reading this one, okay? He wrote the highest, I have it right on my computer, the highest thing you could do with your life is make it so that every moment that passes before you is better off because it did. That's the highest definition of the purpose of life, that every single moment, every person, every moment that happens to unfold in front of you is better off because it passed by you. It was raised a little. Wow. Yeah. I, I'm going to Google that one. I want that one. <laughs> Let me write that down. All right. Michael Singer, right? Yeah. Yeah. And actually, the, the, the untethered soul he wrote first, then he wrote the surrender experiment. I read the surrender experiment first, and I'm going to suggest you read that one first. When you, by the time you're through with that, you'll think there's nothing more he could possibly have to teach me, and then read the untethered soul anyway, and you'll find there was actually even a lot more. I mean, these are two <laughs> I love it. brilliant books. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Well, once again, thank you for being on, man. Thank you for your time. My we pleasure. all appreciate it. Thank you for the knowledge and have an awesome day. You as well. Thank you. Thanks, buddy.